Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, I'm Billy. I got my man Dame here with me. Going to get the housekeeping out of the way. If you are on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, be sure to go ahead and drop a five star review. Um, that's huge. Helps the podcast out a ton. Helps the both of us out a ton. Um, subscribe to the TikTok, the Instagram. We're throwing shorts up there daily at this point. Um, so yeah, be sure to follow us on our platforms. But as always, how we doing today, Dan? How we feeling? I'm not too great, man. I'm I'm not gonna lie. I'm not doing <laughs> too good, man. But we're gonna power through today, man. We're gonna power through. We got a lot to talk about. Yeah, I wanna I wanna start with the game that that happened last night because we haven't gotten to mm-hmm. talk about this series yet because they tipped off um, <clears> when, we were, when we recorded on Wednesday, Tuesday, whenever it was. Yeah. Um, so we only only kind of got to preview this series. Um, but as of last night, and I know I said it before and I'm going to say it again, right? The Miami Heat, who were three minutes away from being eliminated in the play-in, are two wins away from making the finals and six wins away from hoisting one of those trophies back here. Man. <laughs> Yo, that is so crazy, bro. They're not supposed to be here, bro. They're not supposed to be here, bro. Everybody counting them. I don't even know if Heat fans thought they were going to be here, bro. I did not I know for a fact there was no way Heat fans thought they were beating Milwaukee. There's just no way. And that's yeah. not – I don't even feel like that's a disrespect to Miami. It's just – this is not an eight seed. It don't it's feel not, like bro. an eight seed. It, it's not, bro. Um, the, the way they flip the switch, this isn't – this is not the same se- team as the regular season. It's just not, bro. And – at some point, we're going to have to give them the respect. Because I feel like a lot of people, including myself, just thought, like, okay, they're on some Cinderella-type run. Like, it's going to yeah. stop eventually. Now, this might they, just be who they are, bro. They have my respect. After they beat the Knicks, I was like, look, I don't even – I can't even comfortably say Boston is going to win the series right now. I don't know what to, to what to believe, right? <laughs> like, And it's not, again, to say that we aren't – like, we're not putting proper respect on the, the Heat and who they were in the regular season. It's – their level of play in like in the first round, so much of it was centered around Jimmy Butler, right? How much he took his game to another level. Obviously, the 56 performance being like the peak of that, you know, in round one against Milwaukee, take down the one seed, huge. But really, if you zoom out on this entire postseason, they're every single person that steps onto the floor for them is providing quality meaningful minutes for this heat team i watched hayward highsmith come onto the court in the Knicks series and play quality minutes for the miami heat every single role player every single like top level player jimmy and bam right like everybody on this roster top to bottom has stepped their level of play up and every time it feels like like we said you're right okay cool you beat the bucks you know, yeah, Giannis injury, whatever. Okay, I don't think they're gonna beat the Knicks, and then they beat the Knicks in five. And it's like, here's Boston. You know, it's gonna be a scrappy series. I think Boston will probably make out. You know, make it out. And then you take both games on the road. <laughs> Bro, oh my God! When's the last time I ha- that's happened? I don't. The know. road team has won two games on. Like, I'm gonna look when's the up. last time that's happened? That is crazy. It was the um the stat going around saying like, um because they lost game one. Cool. I f- I think pretty much everybody in the world thought Boston was gonna win game two. Like, there's no way you go down 0-2 at home. And it was like some stat going around saying the the home team has won that game two after losing game one. I think it was 16 straight times, and that streak got snapped last night. Man, that is wow. That's crazy. Yeah, they uh. Getting, let's dive right into really let's dive into the game last night. Game one, um, you know, the Heat he win by seven. Um, Jimmy Butler has a 35 point game, uh, huge for them down the stretch. The close out one out. Game two, um, really, like you said, I think a lot of people were expecting the Celtics to respond with a win, at least get the split on your home floor. Obviously, then you go to Miami looking to, to split there as well and get home court advantage back. So I was out last night, so I got a chance to rewatch, you know, the, you know, each possession from this game with, with League Pass this morning. 
Um, and I just have notes of small things that the Heat did and that the Celtics didn't do um, that I think were, were huge as to why this game swung the way that it did, even with some of the big runs that the Celtics went on. I think they went on a 19-2 run that kind of spanned from like the end of the first quarter into the second quarter. And the Heat just very calmly took the punch and responded. Like poised, you know, veteran team that they are. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing for me, and honestly, I'm glad because I, I know even before we started doing the podcast, like I've been very critical of Bam on the offensive side of the ball. I feel mm -hmm. like he's at times in the past, he's too passive and he leaves a lot to be desired on that end of the floor, especially when we can see the skill set that he has to offer. The first two games of this series, and especially last night, he is being much more of aggressive and not even necessarily in just a, a looking to score perspective. I'm looking at him, especially with a lot of these backdoor cuts that Miami does with guys like Caleb, Mark, Caleb Martin, Max Struess had a couple. Duncan Robinson had like three or four there in the second half. Um, mm -hmm. And he's hitting these nice bounce passes kind of behind the defense. Um, he's – Ability to take Al Horford or Rob Will off the dribble is presenting problems for Boston, even when he's not scoring. Um, just, again, the high level of effort that Miami's playing with is leading to a lot of offensive rebounds off of those shots. And it's tough when you're big as the one contesting and you have guys like Jimmy coming in to try to crush the glass after that or Kevin Love as well. Um, so that's leading to, you know, additional opportunities there. Um, but – he, his ability to create space in the mid-range, his ability to get to the rim um, has really, really impressed me in this series. And, um, you know, he finished last night one assist shot shy of a triple-double, 22-17 and nine. Um, really a phenomenal game from him. Um, what, what do you thought about Bam in this series? I know you, you said that you watched this game live. Um, so what were your thoughts kind of watching him operate? Because I, I was super impressed watching the, the, the tape from last night. No, I I have the same exact note down right now. It's like you can clearly see Bam is like being aggressive. And like you said, it's not just looking to score. It's when he's aggressive like this, it's like he forces the defense to give him a t or pay attention to him and respect him as a scorer. And that leads to, like you said, the backdoor cuts, him making plays for others. Because Bam is, is a real versatile player. Like he can, like you said, take people off the dribble. He can use his speed, his quickness to score for himself. But that added attention allows you to make plays for your other people on your mm -hmm. team. And that's when I feel like the Heat are at their best, when it's not just Jimmy creating most of the offense. It's we can play through Bam a little bit, let yep. him make plays for himself and for others. So, yeah, yeah, you talked about it. We've both been pretty critical of Bam in the past, talking about how he just seems like he's just – he's out there. He's very passive. He's not really aggressive. So, it's, it's Especially honestly, in it's the really, postseason. It, exactly, yep. exactly. It, it's, it's really good to see him, like – use his skill set to his advantage, basically, because mm -hmm. that's something we haven't seen in the past. So it's definitely a, a plus for the Heat right now. And it's it's one of the reasons why they're up in these series, because it's like it's not like I said, it's not just the Jimmy Butler show. It's they're getting contributions from their others, the people off their bench. It seems like they always have at least one person who can give them 20 points unexpectedly. You know, what I mean, last night mm -hmm. it was Caleb Martin, but Bam right now is consistently being aggressive giving them stuff on the offensive end, whether to scoring his passing, along with giving them that elite defense. So he's he's been he's been great in these postseason. Yeah. And going back to your point about Caleb Martin, I, I have a note written down here that just says, is Caleb Martin the greatest role player? Um, because it feels like he does everything that you want out of a role player in his position perfectly. His role is super simple on the offensive end. Space the floor catch and shoot, drive and finish. I don't need anything else from you. And he does all of those things exceptionally well, especially in this postseason. And again, you, like you said, 25 points off the bench for them. That was huge in this game. Their bench has been huge this entire postseason. Um, as much as we've talked about depth for some of these playoff teams, especially the ones that are remaining with the Celtics or the Nuggets, this Heat bench may be the most impressive out of all of them. Um, especially even going back to that Knicks series, that was something that was, uh, you know, a lot of the talking heads saying before the, the series that Knicks bench is going to be a, a critical factor in the series just because of how deep they can go, how many different looks they can give you. 
the Heat bench almost doubled their scoring output in that that five game series. And we're seeing it again here, like you said, different guys coming off the bench every night. Game one, it was Kyle Lowry coming out. He got hot there in the, the second and third quarters um, mm-hmm. and had provided a huge stretch of scoring um, that helped lead to that one. This game is Duncan Robinson and, and Caleb Martin coming off the bench, combining for it was 40 points. Um, so a huge scoring output um, from the Heat bench, like you said. Every single person on this team stepping up and, and providing a higher level of play. Um, and, and going back to Bam again, another thing I have here, like, is specifically looking at the Max Struess and Bam pick and roll. I liked a lot of the looks that that provided. Um, again, to your point, with Bam being aggressive, they have to, you know, they have to pay attention to him now. They can't kind of disregard him as a scorer. Right. Um, and so you see there's a lot of times where um, we've had you, – you could see Max Struess coming off of the screen – and Al is hedging towards Bam side. The, the whoever's guarding kind of in that drop position is also hedging towards Bam side. So that gives Struess two really good options to either shoot with a guy kind of like trailing off his hip, which is, you know, for any shooter in this league, it's an open shot you take 10 times out of 10. Mm-hmm. But vice versa, because they're hedging over to Bam side, if you can get downhill quick, you're looking at a finisher, you know, going to the free throw line most likely. Um, so I thought that worked really well. I saw him be able to do that with, Gabe Vincent, Struz, Duncan Robinson, anybody that came in, um, you know, another interesting part about the way the roster is constructed is just they have so many guys who are adept at shooting off of screens, moving in that that way. Um, and so those actions were, were really successful for them last night. Um, and again, it's only amplified by Bam being aggressive because that that puts even more strain on the, the defenders there. So, yeah, 100 um... percent. Yeah, like I said, it's it's just funny because the Heat really always just get somebody to step up, man. It's just, this Heat culture is ridiculous, bro. Like, mm-hmm. like you said, going into the postseason, no one would think that they had the depth to compete with any of these teams, that they would have someone being able to step up and compete with any of these teams in the playoffs. And not to mention, they're missing Tyler Hero. That's twenty. That's twenty points. And there. Oladipo. And exa- And Oladipo. It's yep. like. Bro, like, it does not matter who's in the lineup for them. They will plug you in, and you will contribute to this team. It's like they're all bought in. They all play as a team. It's not, it's, it's really great to watch, if I'm being honest. It's, it's great to see. As much as we talk about uh, the Celtics and their miscues, you, ha- you have to give credit to the Miami Heat. You got to give credit to the coaching. Like you said, give credit mm-hmm. to Bam, Jimmy, all that. You just you cannot say a lot of it is just – because I've, I've seen people say, like, the Celtics are blowing this. The Miami Heat are, are winning these games. It's not just the Celtics choking. Miami Heat is, are winning these yep. games. So you have to give them credit right now. 100%. And to go back to the coaching aspect, another huge thing that I saw, especially in game two, there's a concerted effort by the Heat to show Tatum bodies as many mm-hmm. times as they can. It, and it doesn't matter what defensive they've co- the covers they're in. If they're in man, especially they're like forcing him baseline – and whoever's in that corner is hedging over and they're coming and shading up. So it's never free lanes for him to drive. It's never easy for him to hit that side step that he likes to go to. But someone can always come and add an additional contest there and just kind of clog that up. If they're in there, that kind of zone look. And I saw this a lot. And Boston is going to have to fix a lot of these unforced errors, really. Um, where they'll have one guy kind of at the top of the zone and they just bring those two guys there and just trap him immediately. And then mm. I've so many tough passes that they're just throwing right to heat defenders. Um, and then any screen action that Tatum gets in, any type of pick and roll, um, they are blitzing him immediately, trying to force him into a tough situation, get the ball out of his hands, which is what you have to do in the playoffs because um, – you know, it's been said so many times when you're going to the postseason again, it's completely different from the regular season. What works for you, your, your go-to move, your next, your next go-to move after that one, those get taken away immediately. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why the great players, you have to be adept at scoring in so many different ways because we're only watching film on Boston. We know what you like to do. We know where you like to go. We know what spots you like on the court. We're going to take away a and B. Can you beat us? using C, D, E, and so on and so forth, right? And from these first two games, it does not look like Boston has the adjustments necessary right now um, 
to do that. Going into game three, like, that obviously is a must-win game. No team has ever come back from a you know, an 0-3 deficit before. Mm-hmm. So you cannot have another game because game one and game two combined, Jason Tatum has not made a field goal in the fourth quarter. That cannot happen. I've seen people say that, you know, people are putting too, too much of this, you know, being down 0-2 on Missoula, which I think is probably true to an extent because, again, they can only control so much. He didn't poke Jimmy Butler in the fourth quarter. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that Grant Williams thing. But, the, uh, but realistically, right, it's a combination of multiple things. And how were you able to win game seven in Philly on Jason Tatum's back? Mm-hmm. How were you able to have all the success in the regular season? Jason Tatum finished fourth in MVP voting. Mm-hmm. Your stars have to show up. It's not good enough to play three quarters and then go AFK in the fourth. You see, that was that was my main thing that like so I felt like the Celtics offense were it was it looked like it was running well through three quarters. You know what I mean? That Robert Williams pick and roll high pick and roll with Tatum. I feel mm-hmm. like he was making good decisions. He was making the the right passes. Obviously, you know, there were some times that it was some there was some turnover. The Miami the Miami Heat is a good defense, but I felt like through three quarters that they were making good decisions. They were making the right read. They were playing really well, and it just seemed like in the fourth quarter, I don't know if that defense just locked in or it's like they I like you said they make an effort to get the ball out of Tatum's hands. But it seemed like yep. in the fourth quarter, especially like they really hone in on that. Like anybody but Tatum is going to beat us in this fourth quarter. So mm-hmm. I, I kind of want to get your perspective on that. Like, if do you think that's more of I guess you already said, like, Tatum has to be more aggressive. But it's like, if they're trapping him, getting the ball out of his hands, it's like, what adjustment can you really make in that fourth quarter to get him going? Because, you, like you said, Tatum didn't make a field goal in the fourth quarter, but also Jalen Brown didn't make a field goal, a field goal in that fourth quarter as well. Mm-hmm. So I don't like, think Tatum didn't take a shot in the fourth quarter, right? I don't think I saw. So. I think I think most of his points was free throw. I mean, if he took a shot, he missed. But I don't, I didn't, I don't remember him shooting a shot in the fourth quarter. I know he had, I think, four points from the free throw line, but... Game one. Game one, he did not attempt a shot in the fourth quarter. Game three, he was 0 for 3, all three of them being threes with two turnovers. Yeah, um, I, I remember game one, he did – I think he was trying to score. There was a couple of times I remember he had some travel violations. Like, he just – Oh, my gosh. Know, those yeah, he had a couple. Yeah. yeah, he had a couple, like, just, like, miscues in, in game one. So, I mean, I don't I don't know. I A lot of it is on Joe Missoula, in my opinion, because I feel like – even going back to game one, right, the Heat – have a score of 46 points in the third quarter. No timeouts being called. Like, you're not stopping the bleeding. I mean, I, I guess he is a coach that they he wants you to play through it, but it's like at some point you have to stop the momentum. Like, you mm-hmm. can't let that big run go on and not call a timeout. But um, And then in game two, it's like the Celtics just, you know, they don't execute in the fourth quarter. And then I feel like that part of it comes down to coaching because we've seen if the game is close going into the fourth quarter, the Celtics most of the time will lose. Like, when they beat you, normally they beat you with a blowout win or, like, a comfortable win. When the games are close, the teams, even if they're not as talented as the Celtics, they will win the game. We've seen that with the Atlanta Hawks. Yep. We've seen that in games with the Sixers. We've mm-hmm. seen that in this series. But the game is close, they do not win. And I say a lot of that, in my opinion, is on Missoula because, like you said, on the other side, you have the best coach in basketball, where it seems like Miami, they're always executing. They're always making the right decision late in, late in the game, so... I feel like a lot of that is on Missoula, and it's tough because it's like, like I've seen, he's not really supposed to be this head coach for this team, so it is kind of tough. He's a first-year coach, so it's like, I understand. I understand he's going to make some mistakes, but yeah, it's, I think he's the youngest coach in the league, too. I think he's like, yeah, he's like 34 years old, yeah. so it's like. Al Horford under- is older than him. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I understand why you're making mistakes, but it's like, you're in the Eastern Conference Finals, bro, like. You got to change something. Something has yeah. to change because right now it's not looking good for the Celtics. And, and this – exactly what you said is one of the biggest reasons why I don't want to put so much blame on Missoula because this is his first time being a coach and he's in the Eastern Conference Finals. Mm-hmm. How many times has Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum been in the Eastern Conference Finals? They were in the finals last year. Mm-hmm. Y'all have been here before. I don't want to hear the age arguments anymore. He's 24, he's 26. Look, y'all have been here so many times before. 
age is not playing a factor in this. You have to pull from past experiences and not be 0-2 in the Eastern Conference, like down 0-2 in the Eastern Conference Finals. Um, to your point about the fourth quarter, realistically, if I was Missoula, the biggest thing I would have moving forward to try to, again, you have to win game three. You have to play faster, which is, again, going to just be hard to do because of the amount of effort and hustle that the Heat play with. But mm -hmm. you, at this point, you can't even match that. You have to exceed that because of how much problems the Heat's half-court defense is giving your team right now. And some of that I've seen people try to chalk up to the Celtics not really having a true point guard on the roster and like running so much Marcus Smart, not having like a true pass first guy that can run their offense. <laughs> but at the same time, who's doing that on the Miami end? Right. They don't have a true, what you would want a prototypical point guard, right? Mm. So I don't even really want to go down that route and say that that's all the, the issue there because the team you're going against is doing it without, you know, the same type of circumstances. So a priority number one needs to be, we need to get as many points as possible in transition. We need to get as many points, even if they make a basket, we need to get up the court and we need to go fast. We cannot allow them to get into these full set defenses. Like I said, they're trapping off of these screens. They're running that, zone where they're keeping bam so deep underneath the rim and again trapping anybody if you get you know one person at the top of the key they're sending two bodies immediately um they're switching so much again with bam's versatility all of that is presenting so many problems for boston um which led to 15 turnovers in this game nine steals for the heat to boston's two in game two they are really struggling to play in the half court. So I think priority number one just has to be you have to play faster. You have to get out in transition. And again, even if they make a basket, everything just has to be at a, a, a different tempo going into game three. Because like I said, as it sits right now, they do not have a good answer for the different defenses that Miami is able to throw at them in the half court sets. Um, another thing too, going into game three, tell Grant Williams to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> don't ever let him trash talk ever bro because whenever he decides to open his mouth things go horribly wrong you remember that <laughs> thing with the free throw line with Donald <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make, make both I'm, gonna make, I'm making both bro <laughs> miss both free throws but yeah uh, seriously though um I think Jimmy Butler is the last guy you kind of want to get riled up and I don't I don't think that that was a the reason they lost the game like Jimmy Butler wasn't like, oh, you want to talk? Now let me go score eight straight points. Like, nah. Right. Like, he he gonna already was going to try to do that regardless. Right. Yeah, you motivated him a little bit more. But it's like he was going to close this game for them regardless of whether he was talking or not. It was just kind of funny how that worked out. But mm -hmm. um, on a serious note, though, I feel like the Celtics have to do a better job of not letting Jimmy Butler play one-on-one. -on -one. Because it seemed like a lot, of, a lot of times in that fourth quarter, he is just ice one. I think it was twice on Grant Williams. It was once on... I forgot who the defender was. There's one was. on Brogdon. Like, Brogdon, I think that's who it was. I'm like, you're not sending a, you're not sending a double team. You're not helping at all. You're just letting him play one on one, get to his spots in the mid range, rising up and shooting right over you. On the other hand, you have your best player Tatum getting completely taken out of the game because they're trapping yep. him and getting the ball out of his hands. And that again is on coaching. I understand he's yeah. young. I understand he's technically not even supposed to be here. He's not even supposed to be this coach for this team right now, but. You're here. Like, something has to change. You have mm -hmm. to do a better job of that because there's no way you're just going to watch your best player get put in prison by this trap, by this double team, and then let Jimmy Butler have all the space in the world and just play one-on-one. -on -one. That can't happen moving forward. Yep. Uh, nine points for Jimmy after him and Grant got into it like that. And like you said, the ISOs that they were running for him were like full court clear outs. Mm -hmm. I'm going to the right wing. No one else is past the midway point of the free throw Everybody line. Was Everybody's on the yeah. other side of the court. It's not even good spacing. Like, <clears throat> I don't even care if it's Al or somebody sliding over and we just, like, pinch down into the paint and try mm -hmm. to, you know, eliminate that quick pass to Bam. 
like you have to do something. Because again, to your point, on the other end, Spoh's made that adjustment from the tip. We're not letting Tatum get easy looks. Why in the most important part of the game is the best player on the other team able to get a one-on-one look? On it's Malcolm not, it's, Brogdon. It's unacceptable. It's yeah. unacceptable. On Brogdon is even worse. Mm-hmm. There's no way that that can't be Tatum there. There's no way that that can't be any taller defender. Like, mm-hmm. Jimmy I, has I given the smaller guards problems in the past. And, like, again, mm-hmm. we're doing it all over again. We cannot just keep being so – teams in general in the NBA, I think, are – we're almost, like, too reliant on switching. At some point, especially down the stretch, bro, you need to hunker down. I am going – refuse to switch. Refuse. Right. At least try. That's my thing. I at least need you. I at least need to see an effort on the defensive end. It's like mm-hmm. they just he got the switch that he wanted. He called the clear out, and they're like, "All right, well, let's just hope Brogdon gets the stop." Like, we can't have that, bro. We really right. can't have that. I need to see, like I said, some sort of effort. I need someone to try to help over. I need something. Like, you cannot have right now the best player on the court, mm-hmm. ISO in late into the game, and especially after he already made a couple of those mid range shots. It's like. Okay, you let one go, fine. Like, because he made one over Grant Williams. I think Grant Williams is a decent defender. He can't guard Jimmy Butler one on one, obviously, but he's a decent defender. Mm-hmm. Cool. After that, I'm not watching him get three more, basically open mid range shots. Because, like you say, he's shooting right over the defender. So right. I, and I even if need... he's not, he's putting his shoulder through these little guys' chest. They just, yeah. Brogdon is not big enough. It doesn't matter. It's not a quickness issue. Mm-hmm. He he can't stay in front of him because he's getting thrown under the basket. Yeah, like you said, the whole time we have a 6'10 elite defender over here. We have another 6'8 elite wing defender over here. It's like there's no way he should get to switch on Malcolm Brogdon. Like you said, refuse to switch. Refuse to let that happen. And I would even be comfortable if you're going to – if you're going to give up something, give up a three, right? If you want to play further back and try to deny and pack the paint, cool. But, again, you're letting him get to that – the whole half of the court to work with. And even as he drives into the post, Al is still touching. Bam. Like, come on. It, you have to have to commit to something there and make someone other than Jimmy beat you in these scenarios. And that has not happened in either games. And that is, again, like you said, that is completely on Missoula. You have to make a defensive adjustment there. There's a lot of other issues on the court that the players need to figure out. That is something that you can directly say, hey, Joe, you have to make a change, something. Someone else but Jimmy has to beat you in these situations. Because if not, you're going to lose game three, and you're going to lose the series. And the Miami Heat are going to be, what, the second eight seed to ever make the finals? Wow. I'm not gonna lie. My, do you think the series is over? Two zero going back home, like that's a different. That's different. Obviously, we're gonna talk about the Lakers later, but mm-hmm. that is completely different than you're down two zero and you're going home. You're yeah, going on the road down two zero. I feel like even if you split here, the series is kind of over. You're gonna be down three one. Like you, ha- you would have to win both of these games on the road, which I think they're a good enough team to do. They yeah. weirdly play better on the road for some reason. They weirdly play better when their back is against the wall. So I'm not completely counting them out. But I don't think I've I don't think I've I don't remember a time I've I've seen the home team go down 0-2. Like I genuinely don't remember the last time I've seen that. I am not counting the Celtics out, but I don't think it's too far fetched to say the Heat may be the most consistent team this postseason, them in, in Denver. Yeah. Like night in, night out. I know what type of effort. I know what type of performance I'm getting from the stars. I know I'm getting good performances from the role players as a whole and probably one or two of them to step up and have a really good game. And that's happened every night. First series, they closed in five. Second series, they closed in five. Now they're up 2-0. I don't, again, I don't want to say the series is over, Mm -hmm. but it is a like a mountainous task in front of Missoula and Tatum and Brown and the whole Celtics organization right now. Even if you win both of them in Miami, 
I, I, it, nothing is, it's never going to be comfortable if, until you right. close the series out until you mm-hmm. win four, there's no comfort level. This is the weirdest team because it's like, they say they win these two on the road and they go back and they think, oh, okay, it's the best of three. We have two games at home. That's weirdly like the, I don't, I don't know. Like when they're at home, it's like, they play worse. It's like, I expect them to lose at home more than I do on the road. Like, which that doesn't make sense to me. This is like the, and it's been like this last year too. They lost a lot of games at home in the playoffs, mm-hmm. whether it was the Buck series, whether it was the Heat series. It's like, I don't know. This, this Celtics team is just so weird. And that part of it, I don't think is on coaching because like I said, last year they did the same exact thing. They were losing home games in the playoffs under Ime Udoka. So it's like that part, I don't really think is on coaching. I don't know what it is, but this this Celtic team is just really weird when it comes to that. They were they were the only team left that had lost a home game in the playoffs, right? Because Denver hadn't lost at home. Miami, uh, Lakers, Denver, none of them lost at home. Right, and the, the Celtics were like they're like four and four at home. Yeah, they're four. Yeah, exactly, four and four. Yeah, which um, is weird. And they play the Hawks. They, and now they're they four and eight. six, right? Or four and five? One of the two. Four, four and five. I think they're four and five because I think the four and four is after. Yeah, I think they're four and five. Yeah. Um, That's why. Uh, yeah, I don't know. They. Uh, I, I don't think the series is over, but I am. I would pretty confidently say we're going to see Miami in the finals. <sighs> Miami back to the finals would be wow. That's crazy. Do you see a world where Boston goes and wins both? in Miami like right like right now realistically like yes it can be done but like do you really feel in your heart of hearts that Boston can go and pull that off with Jimmy with Bam with Spo and all the veterans UD in the locker room telling all of them how much this means like (laughs) honestly honestly no I don't think they're gonna win both I I think they're gonna win game three um I I hope so (laughs) yeah I, I think they're gonna win game three but it's Normally when a team is up, right, when a team is up in a series, when the team is up in a game, they can kind of re- – they relax a little bit. It's like human nature to kind of take your foot off the gas. Mm-hmm. The Miami Heat are not humans. So they're not going to take their foot <laughs> like off the androids gas. or something. I, bro, <laughs> I swear, bro. Like you said, Spolstra, UD, Jimmy, all these guys will have, have – all of them will have these guys locked in, basically, and know, like, listen, we can't give up games here. Let's, let's, let's end it. Let's put these guys away. So against this Miami Heat team specifically – I don't see the Celtics winning both on the road. I think they'll win one, and I think it'll be three one going back to Boston. But I just I can't see a world where they win both on the road. So that means you need two great Tatum games, and that means not just one through three, and as far as the quarters, not just the first through the third quarter, one through four, every single quarter, a great Tatum game. And for two games, I don't know because Tatum could be very inconsistent. And mm-hmm. I feel like you need him to step up. You need him to have this MVP MVP caliber two games here, which I'm not saying he cannot do. Obviously, you know he's capable of it, but just the the way this postseason has gone with the Celtics, I just don't see that happening. I don't see it happening, especially if y'all keep giving Jimmy one on one looks. If there mm-hmm. are not any like serious defensive adjustments made, they have no chance. There has to be something from a game plan perspective on top of, like you said, Tatum has to show up. Brown has to show up. Mm -hmm. There has to be something schematically that changes to limit the heat. Because, again, from every angle, and I know it's probably tough because of how well the role players have been shooting and the team has been shooting as a whole this entire postseason. Like, yeah, if you double, you're letting these guys get really super open looks, but you got to take something away, right? Gotta take something away. Yeah, that that's the thing too. I I also don't trust Missoula to make the proper ad- adjustments moving forward to have these guys in a position to tie it up two two going back. So, yeah, if you swap these coaches, this is a sweep. Like if you put Spo on the Celtics, <laughs> this is a sweep, bro. It's like this isn't even a competition because Celtics are a better team. Like I think everyone can agree, like they are a more talented team than the, than the healthier Heat. team. Exactly. Talent perspective. Right. right, they had to check all those boxes. Can't uh, measure heart. Can't, and that coaching difference is just that's it's huge right now. It is like the arguably the best coach in the league. To I'm not trying to disrespect Joe Mazzulla. Like I said, he's the first. It's an experience coach. factor for now. And I don't, 
and I'm not blaming him as far as like you should be a better coach. It's like he's a he's not even supposed to be the coach for this team. He's mm-hmm. not supposed to be here. So it's not like disrespect to him. He could end up being a great coach later down the line. But just as of right now, the way this matches up, it's a huge coaching difference. Yeah, for sure. Moving on to the Western Conference Finals. As always, I'm going to let the Lakers fan go first, but the Lakers are now down 0-2, going back to L.A. um, after Jamal Murray erupted in the fourth quarter of game two. So I'm not even going to dive into any analysis. I'm just going to – your initial thoughts, reactions, feelings. (laughs) If you need to vent, you need to get it off your chest. Let it out, man. So when that game ended, bro, I sat on my couch – and I just stared in the darkness for a solid, like, 15 minutes. Not on my phone. Bro, people think this is a game. I'm a diehard Lakers fan. Like, I'm not a LeBron fan. Because, obviously, you know, we post the clips on TikTok and Instagram. I get these all these LeBron fans. I'm a diehard Lakers fan, like, since I was a kid, bro. And, man, that loss. I don't remember the last time I got hurt so bad from a loss, bro. Just because. So, <clears throat> we could dive into the game. Basically, what I got from this game is. As good as the Nuggets are offensively, I don't think they have an answer for us defensively. I don't think that – I think LeBron can get whatever he wants when he wants to, which is frustrating because we'll talk about, you know, the decisions later into that game. But I feel like he can get whatever he wants. I feel like Anthony Davis, he had some good looks. I feel like a lot of his looks he just missed. Like, when Anthony Davis has his bad games, normally it's because he's passive, he's not being aggressive. But I feel like he shot he – was, he was decently aggressive. It's just a lot of the same looks that he had in the first game that were dropping – just didn't fall for him, whether it was that little floater, that six to eight foot floater, whether it was that elbow jump shot, it wasn't really just falling for him. So it is what it is uh, in that aspect. Um, I do, I will say the Nuggets did a great job of not just giving up the switch with Jamal Murray a lot of the mm-hmm. times. I feel like they did a good job of trying to fight through and not just, and like I, like you said in the first game, they just let them, let Murray get on LeBron James, get these switches, and then they were, you know, uh, attacking the basket off that but they were doing a lot better job of that this game but man I feel like we had control of this game pretty much the whole time like we had control of the game for the most part the whole game but I think that one little stretch in the fourth quarter LeBron shot back-to-back threes where I feel like it's just it was not needed whether you were tired I get it but if you're tired I'd rather you pass it to someone else, let Austin Reeves go, let D'Lo go, whoever's in the game with you at that point. I'd rather them try to get a better look than you settling for a three uh, in those moments, especially back-to-back threes. That just – that was demoralizing. And then Jamal Murray came down. He got hot, kind of looked like Tatum in that game six of that Sixers series. You just – that part of it – listen, Jamal Murray's a great player. Like, this is no Nuggets disrespect. Like, the Nuggets are a great team. That Like, there's no disrespect here. Jamal Murray is a great player. And once he has it going like that, it's kind of tough, bro. Because he, when he gets hot, he can score w- like with the best of them, with the best of them in the league. Like when yeah. he gets hot, he he looks like one of the best scorers in the league. So, but I just feel like those threes late in that in the fourth, it's just they they, they weren't needed. Like they really just weren't needed. We could have gotten a better look than that. And I feel like that there's a lot of things that made us lose that game. But I feel like that was like the turning point of the game right there because they kind of got hot and they just never looked back. And it was, man, that one hurt, bro. I'm gonna be honest, that one hurt bad. I said, I said we was gonna win one in Denver. Now we're going back to LA, down 0-2. I still, I still, I still feel like we're fine. I feel like we can, we can defend home court. Like we said, the Nuggets and the Lakers have not lost at home this whole postseason, so I, I think we're fine. But, man, it's just – it's going to be tough. I'm not going to lie. It's definitely going to be tough. Yeah, both of these games, back and forth down the stretch, very winnable for both teams in game one and game two. Um, even with the, you know, the, the huge lead that the Nuggets had in game one, the Lakers were able to fight back, cut it to as low as three multiple possessions in game one and just could not tie the game up. And like you said in this one, those threes by LeBron, man, they just unneeded, unneeded for sure, especially from a guy who did not make a three in this game. He hasn't made it all. Then the first game, either. he hasn't. He's shooting zero percent in the Western Conference Finals. Donut. 
Yeah. Why you don't have it going? You don't need to. Let's see. I'm gonna rant a little bit. Now. I'm gonna try to calm down. I was about to start ranting. You don't need to shoot those threes when you don't have it going, bro. Like if you made one or two beforehand, I would get it. The same thing I said about the, in the first game when he took that three to try to tie the game, which. I'm not too mad about that. Like, it is – you make that, it changes the whole game. It is what it is. But these two, it's like you don't have it going. You haven't made a three all series long. This isn't the time for that. And I understand it's LeBron James. He knows what he's doing. But still, uh, you got to take some criticism for that. A hundred percent. Watching it was like as soon as it went up, I'm like, why? It's, just, it's exactly. not the shot that you need in that moment. You don't even need a three in these mm-hmm. moments. And you're not the guy. You're just not the guy for that. <laughs> right, and right. It's crazy to say that to Le- like about LeBron of all people, but bro, this has never been your strong suit. Your entire career, you've gotten better at it. A, I said, he hasn't even made one in the series, so it's not like you're hot. It's not like mm. you had any rhythm going. <clears throat> it just it, it feels like the superhero shot. It, we don't need a superhero shot right now if you're the Lakers. So mm-hmm. um, that is, like I said, that, that three definitely was a turning point there in the fourth quarter. Um, <laughs> before I get into some of my analysis, what do you think of the flop off between <laughs> between LeBron mm-hmm. and Jokic? <laughs> that was it. Was funny because LeBron had got him, and it, and it's funny because Jokic doesn't really. I, I respect Jokic a lot. I really do. The Jokic is not one of those superstars. You see the guys that complain all the time about flopping, about, oh, I got fouled here, I got fouled here. So now Jokic, like, he'll say what he needs to say sometimes, but a lot of times he just gets back on defense or offense, yeah. whatever it is. But it's funny because he's so smart. To get him right back the next possession, it was hilarious. I could, bro, I wasn't even mad at it. I was like, I respect it. I really do. Because, I, listen, I, I, like I said, I'm a Lakers fan, but I feel like I'm a very unbiased Lakers fan. We do flop. Like, I'm not going to sit here and lie. Like, Dennis Schroeder is, like, one of the most – like, he flops every single game. I've watched all the Lakers games, like, especially, like, past the All-Star break once we made the trades. I've watched every single Lakers game. Dennis Schroeder is one of the kings of flopping in this league. Him and Marcus <laughs> Smart are up there, bro. They're bad. <laughs> the so, him, along with LeBron, even though I do feel like LeBron genuinely gets fouled a lot of the times, like, especially when he's driving to the basket, mm-hmm. I don't feel like a lot of those are flops. Like, he gets – killed when he goes to the basket but he um, just he sells the contact he does which is he definitely m- does most players in the league do that's just be- kind of like it or not become a reality mm. of the league like you yeah. sell contact i've seen people try to make the argument that jordan never sold contact i promise oh, you if jordan played in 2023 that man would sell contact because it gets you to the free throw line and exactly you do what you need to do to win game so that's kind of become a reality of it, but the Lakers as a team definitely <laughs> do flop. Yeah. Uh, Jokic is hilarious for immediately <laughs> flopping back on the other end and, and trawing the foul. Uh, that, that cracked me up. But another triple-double from him, 23-17-12 and 12 in this game. Um, but, again, the, the biggest story being Jamal Murray, 23, right? 23 or 24 in the fourth mm-hmm. quarter alone. I think that's the fourth 20-point quarter he's had in his postseason career, which is more than guys like Michael Jordan have had. I think it's like double the amount that Jordan, I think Jordan only had two. Um, so that <laughs> goes to, like you said, his ability to get hot and then it's scoring just like takes off to another level. It just becomes unguardable. Um, his microwave button <laughs> – is Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame, Hall fashion, of right? Fame. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, that is crazy. So, so he has the ability to get hot in a hurry, and then just the shot making from him is unbelievable. Tough shots, fall away jumpers. His even coming out of the post, some of those fadeaways, like everything is buckets at that point. So that that was super tough. Um, for the for the Lakers to deal with in the fourth quarter, I mean, it's just sometimes, like you said, you got to tip your cap um, to a guy who, who's got it going like that. But, you know, Porter came big with some threes in this game. Um, the the Nuggets as a whole, Jokic and Murray combined for, for seven steals in this game, just the, the two of them alone, um, which was huge. I think they won the, the turnover battle, yeah, 17 to, to 12 in terms of 
or actually the no, other way around, 17 for the, the Nuggets there in terms of turnovers, but more points off of turnovers for the Nuggets. Um, so, yeah, like I said, both these games were winnable um, for the Lakers in this series. I think the adjustment to play Rui more again um, definitely helped. He was huge in, you know, keeping, like you said, control of the game for the Lakers, especially in the first half there, which many rant I'm about to go on, but shout out to ESPN. Y'all have one of the worst apps known to mankind. I could not watch the first half of this game <laughs> on the ESPN app because it would not authenticate that I had cable, even though to end up watching the game, I just had to log into Xfinity on the Xfinity stream app and watch it on ESPN that way, which makes no sense. Neither here nor there. Y'all need to fix y'all app. Same way the NBA League Pass does. Um, but, yeah, it just – D'Lo also is getting hunted on He's the unplayable defenses. right now. Yeah, he's getting hunted on, on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, a clip actually just resurfaced. He was making fun of Michael Porter Jr. Uh, I think it was in the, in the bubble saying that they were hunting him and I think when the Lakers and, and Nuggets were playing in the, in the mm-hmm. bubble playoffs, he was on J.J. Reddick's podcast, and he was like, dang, they going at Porter. I don't want to be like him. And I don't know if they heard it and took it to heart, but they are going at D'Lo uh, on mm-hmm. the defensive side of the ball. He has not really been able to, to really get it going, especially in this game, only three for eight from the field. Um, so he's had a rough go at it. Again, we've seen Darvin Ham make starting lineup adjustments, pull guys out of the rotation. Do you put Rui in here and just run go super big? I don't know. But, look, down 0-2, going home, everything should be an option on the table because same thing that we said in the, the Heat Celtic series, being down 0-2 game three is an absolute must win. So mm-hmm. and whatever adjustments you – think could work like you have to start laying everything on the line here um again definitely different being going to game three at home and the lakers haven't dropped one at home so much better possibility that they're able to to you know regain both games and go back to denver for game five you know even series at that point but even being down 0-2 both these games have been close um so there's a lot to be Again, still somewhat optimistic about for the Lakers, but Nuggets team, like I've said, this entire postseason can beat you in a variety of ways. You get Jokic games, you get Porter games, we've gotten Caldwell Pope games, we get Jamal Murray games. They have so many guys who are able to step up and fill it up from a scoring perspective, play phenomenal defense on, on the other side of the ball. So they, they continue to impress me more and more. Jokic is this run that he's going on, I think the stat that they use was advanced box score plus minus would be the second highest plus minus in playoff history behind, I think it was the I think it was 2018 LeBron. So that playoff run where, he, where he carried them to the finals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was a Jordan, <clears throat> Jordan finals run in there as well. So it's like okay. the level of play – and how much he's shouldering for this Nuggets team. Like, I do not want that to go unappreciated. I know Michael Malone feels like it's going unappreciated if you listen to any of his press conferences. Rightfully so. Uh, yeah, because that's the reality of sports media today. Mm-hmm. They'll, the Nuggets will win a game and they'll post LeBron's face after. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is crazy. <laughs> it, it is insane. Like, I'm not – listen, like I said, I, I feel like I – because I know Lakers fans can get crazy, especially now that, like, you know, LeBron's on the team. So now it's a combination of Lakers fans and LeBron's fans. So it can definitely get a little bit crazy. But I, I do feel like Nuggets slightly are kind of getting – I don't know if it's disrespected, but a lot of the talk is – I would say it's, it's disrespect. They had yeah. – you know, Lisa Salter is a sideline reporter for ESPN. Mm-hmm. She came out and um, she said that she feels like she had been sleeping on Jokic. I'm like – how? You, you've been at you've been at the game. So you right. talked to him. This is he's won two MVPs. You got Jalen Rose on ESPN saying he's about finally to say that. a superstar. <laughs> like what? Two what? MVPs later, he's finally a superstar. Like what? Back are we to doing? back MVPs. Now he's entering the superstar discussion. Like All what right. are we talking about right now? Yeah, I just have not watched the Nuggets. Yeah, I have not watched Jokic. 
But going back to the game, man, it's, uh, it is tough. Like you said, with the D'Lo thing, D'Lo is a minus 41 for us right now on the court. He is giving us nothing right now. <laughs> He's giving us absolutely nothing. But to not start him is tough because I feel like this Lakers team is a very like, unified group. I feel like a lot of the people – like, you know, you take Vando out of the starting lineup, he comes in and gives us great minutes when he's inserted back into the starting lineup. Or the few minutes that he comes off of the bench, he'll come in and he'll hustle. He'll 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 try he'll he'll try his asshole. But D'Lo is interesting because like I don't feel like he's one of those guys that would like mope and be be mad if he's not starting. But then again, it's like I don't really know. Cause it's I feel like a lot of the times when D'Lo has a big game, you know early if he has it going. Like, he'll start the game off in the first quarter. He'll make a three here. Yeah. He'll make a couple of tough mid-range shots. So, I feel like I feel like at, at worst, you can still start him, see if he has it going. And a lot of times, even when we're winning in games that we won in past series, if D'Lo doesn't have it going, he does not close the game for us. Like yeah. You might not see him in the whole fourth quarter, which to his credit, he, he still – you'll see him cheering on the sideline. He'll, you'll see him cheering Dennis Schroeder on. Like, he's not moping or anything, but I don't know. Not starting him, I guess, is definitely a possibility. But for now, I just feel like when he does have it going, that added, that added scoring is such a bonus that it's like it'd be nice to see it, at least if he has it going first before we just completely yank him out of the rotation or out of the starting lineup. But um, that's been tough. I do feel like Vando deserves way more minutes, though. I understand he kind of limits us offensively, but so does Aaron Gordon for them. So it's like. I, I feel like, especially when moments when Jamal Murray in that fourth quarter absolutely is on fire. And Dennis Schroeder is a good defender, but he also is very, very small. I'm pretty sure he's like probably like an inch or two smaller than Jamal Murray. I just think that Jerry Vanderbilt, his length, his athleticism, he would be able to at least make it more difficult, especially when Jamal Murray has it going. So me personally, I would have loved to see Vando get a little bit more minutes. He only played, mm-hmm. I think it was 17 minutes in this whole game. Yep. After starting the game, and I feel like he played great. I, I feel like he did very well defensively. He started the game off with a steal and a, and a dunk. So it's like his hustle, his energy, Um, I just feel like it's needed sometimes on the court. And I think that it's worth sacrificing a little bit on the offensive end just to get him there, just to slow down Murray a little bit. So I feel like we need to see more of the Vando minutes. Um, I think we need, we need to do a better job of making Aaron Gordon somewhat unplayable. Like just how pe- teams do that to us when Vanderbilt is on the court where they just completely don't guard him. They leave him open from the corner three. I feel like we did a little bit of that, having AD roam a little bit, help out on Jokic. I feel like we do we need to do that more. Whenever Gordon is on the court, if he's going to make threes and kill us, I'm fine with living with that. Like I feel like we completely should just ignore him and get him to the point where he is not playable on the offensive end, meaning you take him out, and that means they're missing – what is that, their best defender yeah. on, Le- on, like, LeBron. They're missing their best defender on the defensive end. So it's like, I feel like we just need to do a better job of punishing punishing them on the offensive end, having Gordon out there so that he's not the, out there playing defense. So, yeah. um, That and another thing, we need to slow down the transition points because there's plenty of times where I've seen Jokic after a miss get the rebound, and he's looking like a guard on the fast break, running full speed up the court, making plays, pushing the ball up, pushing the ball up, pushing the pace. And we're just – our transition defense is just bad as it is. So when you have a center that's so good at pushing the pace and making mm-hmm. great passes and make and great decisions, it, it, it kills us a lot. There was plenty of times where he gets the ball off of a miss and he is just gone. And I'm watching a, I'm watching AD, like, jog back while the whole time Yoga just sprinting up yeah. the court, like full-on sprinting, and they get a good look off of that. So – we definitely need to do a better job of that. And, man, LeBron has to be better, man. Like, I'm for what sorry, it's worth, be better. For what it's worth, I will say, as as much as we've criticized his offensive performance, especially down the stretch of this game, this is probably his best defensive game in the entire postseason. Four steals, mm-hmm. two blocks, out there looking like Ed Reed on some of them, like jumping the passing lane. Yeah. Um, so defensive Guardian instincts, Yogi. right, still out of – you know, elite level, still able to have a huge impact on that side of the floor. But, again, those plays down the stretch on the offensive side of the ball, the bad shooting, like, it's not conducive to winning, especially for how close these games have been. A couple of those shots fall or somebody else takes them or you go and find a better shot, you know, you may be looking at a 1-1 series instead of being down 0-2. So, 
Um, do you even still think Anthony Davis played a, a good game on the defensive side of the ball, still had a lot of impact, shots deterred, four blocks, still doing a very good job of staying out of foul trouble. Um, so, again, when you get to this level in the postseason, like you can't just demand good play. It has to be great. And sometimes it has to be greater and great. And so mm-hmm. you have to nitpick at those small things, those individual plays, because each possession matters just that much more. So, yeah, I, I agree with the, the Vanderbilt take. I think that, you know, when you see a guy getting hot like Jamal Murray, like you've got to, that, that has to be priority number one. You can find offense in other places, but you have to limit Jamal Murray's ability to score there. Um, and additionally, again, to your point, a lot of people were saying, okay, cool. They find the, you know, putting Rui on Jokic is good. You have AD as a roamer. Well, then the Nuggets are just going to stop sitting AG in the dunker spot. They're putting him in other places on the court so that Jokic then just has more room to operate. To your point, they just ignore Aaron Gordon entirely and then just start packing the paint on him. You then put him in position, like we said, with the Heat and Celtics series, make someone that's not the star player beat you. Aaron Gordon mm. has four threes. He makes them all. Tip your cap. Literally. Can't. You just beat the statistics. You beat the odds because you're not that, you know, to that level caliber shooter. It can happen, mm. but that's the, the risk that you take being down 0-2, right? Like you have to take away something because if he misses them, huge hindrance for their offense. Mike Malone might have to pull them, and then that opens up so much more on the – the offensive side for the Lakers. So, <clears throat> yeah, game, game three tonight in Los Angeles. I know you're predicting a win. Um, of course. Come on, man. We're not I, going, I, we're not I, I believe the Lakers will win as well. I don't think they're going to go down 3-0 if they do. Boy, oh, boy, this Nuggets team, man, they're going on a crazy run if, they, if they're they able to pull that one off. But, um, but I mean, I, I honestly, think the Lakers will be able to win this game. But honestly, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're down 0-2, I get it. But they really did what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to protect home court. So it's, exactly. not, it's not the end of the world. We literally just watched them last series go up 2-0 and then lose the next two to right. a worse Phoenix Suns team. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, at the end of the day, they did what they were supposed to do. They're, it was both close games. Now we got blown out both the times at home. That would worry me a little bit. But I feel like we did a decent job of getting rid of the others. Um, on the Nuggets, you know, KCP was in foul trouble early, so he never really got it going. He only ended up with like 18 points. Aaron Gordon with 10 points, which is still a valuable contribution, but it wasn't like the first game where I feel like Jokic, along with the others, absolutely destroyed us. Yeah, like it wasn't the same as the first game. So, um, yeah, we just gotta we just gotta do a better job of executing down the stretch, getting back in defense, getting back in transition, and LeBron just gotta stop shooting, man. Because it's not <laughs> it, it wasn't even. Listen, I don't he. Offensively, I just don't think he had that great of a game. He missed a wide open dunk, like on the fast break. <laughs> he missed a lot of layups that he normally miss. He like we normally would normally would make. Yeah. He got this bro. Every team's dream when you're down four points and um it's like under 24 seconds, so you know yeah. they don't have to take a shot, is to get a steal on the inbound. Like that is like the dream scenario right there. We get the steal, we get the layup. It's an open layup and bro. Smokes smokes. It. Yeah. Like just it's, it was just bad all around. I feel like offensively, people were spreading around the video of him. You know, the ball slipping out of his hands, trying to do that little cradle reverse he always goes to, and it's like, oh my gosh, he's getting old. But that more than anything just feels like a Shaq in a fool moment, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh man, ball just slipped. Him blowing a lot of these layups, that makes me feel like okay, Father Time is truly undefeated. I, I get it, but it's like he's looked old all the whole playoffs, if you really think about it. Like, he's always yeah. looked old. These it was just – I don't know. I don't know how much you can age in a week. <laughs> I don't know how bad Father Time can hit you in a <laughs> week, but it's like it, it, it just looked bad. I don't know how much of it was contributed to – he looked like he kind of re-injured his foot a little bit. I don't know if yeah, – He did roll his ankle, ankle. yeah. He like mm-hmm. rolled his ankle. I don't know how much of it is contributed to that because a lot of times when – I think when LeBron doesn't really have it going, whether it be his he's feeling a little bit of pain in the foot or it's him just being tired in general, that's normally when you see those, I'm not going to drive, I'm just going to pull up and shoot a three type of looks. So I don't know if it was the foot bothering him. Bothering him. Hopefully it's not, but I guess we'll just see moving forward. I, I have confidence that he'll come out and he'll play better offensively. Like, I don't think he's smoking a fast break 
uh, <laughs> a breakaway dunk again. Yeah. But, hey, man, we just we got to play better overall as a team. But I, I have full confidence that we can tie this series up 2 2. And going back to Denver, I think if we win both these games at home, we'll lose game five, we'll win game six, and then we'll see what happens in game seven, bro. It'll just be a toss up. I predicted a seven game series to start. And even again, being down 0 2, the way that both of these games have played close down to the wire, all of that is still like it's still a contested series, being regardless mm-hmm. of being down 0 2. Right. So it always, you know, the, the old adage. Series don't start till a team wins on the road. So, uh, you said, just got to keep defending home court. And, uh, and Lakers got the opportunity to, to do that tonight. Celtics can't do it at all. So, <laughs> I need Jamal Murray to calm down, bro. God <laughs> damn. Like, listen, it's funny too because Jamal Murray is a really good player. I don't think he gets, I think he's a very underrated player. I don't think he gets um, the credit that he deserves as far as being one of the best, not best players in the league as far as, like, top 10 player, but he's definitely one of the most talented point guards in the league. And I, I think he doesn't get enough credit. Like I said, none of this, none of my analysis, none of my prediction is, like, Nuggets disrespect. I think Jokic is arguably the best player in the league at this point. I think Jamal Murray's great. I think the whole team as a whole is great. So um, I definitely see where they're coming from when they feel like they get a little bit disrespected, um, even after games that they win and people talk about the Lakers. So I, I definitely see where they're coming from. 100%. And that's – not even to do anybody's fault, but ESPN, they'd be on, they'd be on the Lakers <laughs> crazy, man. <laughs> I listen, man. I, I can't control that. I can't control that. <laughs> uh, other NBA news that's happened since we last recorded. It's looking all but a done deal that Bob Myers is out in Golden State. Look like they can't come to an agreement on a contract extension. So, Another huge blow to the Warriors, who honestly probably could not come at a worse time with all the decisions that they have to make mm-hmm. going forward. So there, he's going to be a highly sought after executive around the world. 100%. Um, so I don't blame him. Go get your bag. Somebody's yeah. going somebody's gonna to drop a bag for Bob Myers because if I was an owner, I would do the exact same thing, seeing the success that he had. 1,000%. Additionally, this came out last night from Shams. Uh, the NBA is considering going back um, to how the All Star Game format used to be, getting rid of the player draft entirely and going back to a traditional East West game. So, what are your thoughts on getting rid of the draft, going back to how it used to be, East versus West? And I'm hoping having everybody just wear. Their jerseys and not the yeah. all-star jerseys because that used to be tough. That was too fire when people used to wear their own jersey and it just looked, mm-hmm. looked like a bunch of mismatch on the court. That was always fire. I love those. But yeah, um, if they're gonna do that, then yeah, I'm all for the east and west. But honestly, I, I I don't know if I'm in the the minority here. I don't really know most of the consensus on whether people like the the way it is now with you get the team captains and you draft. I personally like that. I feel like it brings like a like a backyard. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah playground hoops type of field to it. You know what I mean? Like I'm picking mm-hmm. you. So I, I don't like how they switched it to where they pick the reserves first because they're trying to make it like, you don't want to have someone be the last pick. Like bro, it's, you know, who's going to be the last pick regardless, whether you pick the reserves first or the starters first. So these are grown men. Like you're not hurting nobody's feelings. They make millions of dollars, but right. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I did like the feeling of it though. I feel like it was like a, like I said, it was like a, playground hoops type of feel like I got you I got you and then you can mismatch you know what I'm saying like with the east and west there's certain players who would never be on the same team just because you know what I'm saying this player has never been in the east this player has never been in the west there's certain players you'll never see on the same team mm-hmm. but I like the way it is now because like I said it's, it's mix, mix and match you can see who like <laughs> who likes certain players more than other players as far as like the team captain picking you know what I mean so like there was a lot of speculation that Giannis and Damian Lillard wants to team up because there's a lot of cut up clips of them talking about oh I respect his game and then the clip of him picking him first in the uh in the in the draft for the mm-hmm. All Star game so I like I like seeing stuff like that though I like the feeling that it brings to the All Star game but at the end of the day none of it's gonna matter if these guys don't play hard like if they're just gonna go out there and it's gonna be a layup line it's really not gonna matter because no one's gonna want to watch the game it's gonna be boring anyways yeah I. I... 
I think it's a cool change of pace to have the draft. Like you said, you'll get matchups and in, in teams that you would have never seen otherwise if they would have just kept it east west. Um, so I I think that that brought something different, but from a rating perspective, it's clear that fans are tuning out more and more because the level of play has definitely taken some dips over the last couple of years. Um, I think the addition of the, you know, the 24 point fourth quarter thing has been cool. Um, especially the first year that they did it. Um, you saw like the last few points, they upped the intensity a lot. Um, that was, I think it was the year Kawhi got MVP. Um, so that I think, like you said, has to be the the main change. But I don't know. I I could see going back to East West to be cool, just for like it's like the nostalgia at this point. It's been so many years mm-hmm. that they've done the, you know, the team captains. LeBron's been a captain every single year, right? Every single one. He's never been a captain. It's been LeBron. Then it's, it's been LeBron and KD. It's been LeBron and Steph. Was it LeBron? I don't think it was LeBron and Steph actually. I think it was LeBron and KD and like LeBron and Giannis. Yeah. I don't know. It might have always only been them too. Yeah. Yeah. But I know KD was that one year. But yeah. It was it was that one year where he um he didn't pick Harden on purpose. He left him as the last pick yeah. because he requested <laughs> a trade out of Brooklyn. But yeah. that was funny. Yeah. That'd be cool. I miss I honestly I would just want it, like you said, just for the jersey matchups alone. I want to go back Facts. to that because that was even you could keep it the setup that it is in drafting, but just pick one team to wear white, pick one team to wear colored, colored jerseys, and then go that way. Because doing that with the All Star patch, that was fire. That was clean. They need to bring that back so I can buy some of those jerseys. <laughs> and everybody loved it, bro. I feel like everyone loved when everyone wore their own jerseys, bro. It was just it was just a cool feeling. It just brought a cool feeling to the game. Hundred percent, definitely. Miss those days, man. Miss those days. Hmm. How you feel about uh, if we going into a little bit of draft talk? I've seen a lot of people, not a lot of people. I've seen like a report basically saying that Portland's looking to trade that number three pick. Mm-hmm. But they were also talking about adding like Anthony Simon into that package too. The the report was to get a a, a elite small forward. I don't know who exactly they're right, talking about. What elite about. small forward is <laughs> on the table? Is what I'm saying like what who are y'all talking about right now? Mikael but, Mikael Jordan probably. Mikel. <laughs> and I see another report saying that they're not looking to trade him at all. So, but even if even if they were, Mikel Bridges and Damian Lillard is not winning a championship. I saw Siakam. Siakam and Damian Lillard is not winning a championship. Like, that's wh- honestly when we talked about this last pod, I was like, okay, they're gonna show the direction that they're going in. They're gonna either trade Dame or trade the pick. I think I I don't remember what I said in the last pod, but now I just feel like you should just trade Dame. That's what I feel like. Because I, I, I don't think the value from the – if you had the second pick and it was Scoot, I think it would be a little bit different. I feel like a lot of people would want, like you know what I'm saying, to trade their maybe disgruntled superstar or their older superstar. But even then, it's like – it's not I Wimby. still would trade Dame in that situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so – Because, look, then you compare – you have a core of – again, say even if you've got the second pick, Scoot, you might still be able to get Scoot with the third pick. That's true. Apparently, because – the Hornets GM came out with Mitch check and was saying that they feel like they're in a position now where they don't need to take best available talent on the board, which I think would be a stupid decision because that agree. same thinking is how they even got LaMelo. The <laughs> exactly. Warriors felt like that and took Wiseman. You exactly. See how that turned out. Take the talent. I promise you, I promise you it will work out. LaMelo was a good enough of a passer that he does not – I think people get pairing up guards of that, you know, who have can have high usage rates and playing that way. I think if you put the two of them together, it's like it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. People are – like at this level, like LaMelo is a good enough basketball player to where he still can be a great playmaker, a great connector for your offense and not have the ball in his hands 24-7, right? Like. Right. That pairing the two of them together would be a great backcourt duo in Charlotte. So you don't need to feel like you need to go and get Brandon Miller or somebody else just for a fit. Take the talent. <laughs> if they pass on him and he fell to Portland, oh my, I, I would trade Dame immediately. You 100%. could have Scoot, Anthony, Shaden Sharp, and whatever you get for trading Dame and just play for the future. 
That's perfect. Like you can, I cannot imagine a better scenario for Portland and go get Dame to a contender somewhere and let him actually compete for a ring again. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any scenario where I think it makes more sense right now for Portland to trade the pick for something and try to keep Damian Lillard because, like you said, the return that you can get does not automatically make the Trailblazers into a contender it's just – it's not going to – even if you paired that with Anthony Simons, like, it's just not enough, you know? There's, like – I don't know who they would get. Let's just say, like, all the players in the league were up for grabs for the most part. What is what is the one realistic one that's, like, that would instantly make them a contender? Like – One player? I don't know that there is one that, That's what I'm saying. Like, I don't think – bro, there – Unless you've got, the, like, right? Giannis or something, right? That's like, what I'm, you have to be, like, a top three player in the world. They're in the draft lottery right now. Like they were in contention to get the number one overall pick. You don't just go from that to let's add this one guy. Now we're contending for a championship. Like there's like steps to this. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I don't think you can add one player, like you said, unless it's like a Giannis or like someone of that caliber, which you're not going to get. You're not adding that one guy to go from literally draft lottery to NBA championship. So. And on top never, of all of that, Jeremy Grant is an unrestricted free agent. Yeah, they're yeah. I don't know. They need to trade Dame, bro. They're just wasting my man's prime, man. They're <laughs> wasting Dame's prime, and he's wasting himself because he's being too loyal, bro. He's being too loyal. I respect it because man, you live your whole life there. You got kids, you got a family. They always been but in it's Portland. Portland, it's the it's like he, he not in he, LA. He, don't, he probably don't have to worry about a thing in that city. That's hit. It's no. Other, you know, NFL team in Portland, like he probably runs the city from a sports perspective. I get it, bro. But it's Portland. You want to run Portland, bro? You really want to run Portland? Like, come on, bro. Like, you could be in Miami. Like, you could be so many other, bro. You could be in so many other places. You're not going to run it. But come on, you could compete for a championship. You're going to get, your brand is going to get bigger. Because, like, bro, you're in Portland already. You're in a small market team. So all these, like, ads. And all this, like, your signature shoe, your rap career, Dame Dollar rap career. Listen, it's not going to be as big as it would be if you go to, like, a Miami or something like that. Where, one, the bigger market, obviously, better city. And they're, you're going to be in the playoffs, bro. There's a lot of people who don't watch regular season basketball. So, it's like, if you're never even in the postseason, like, there's a lot of casuals, obviously, that know Damian Lillard. But it's not going to be as heightened as if you were in the playoffs. Look at Miami right now. Imagine Damian Lillard in the Eastern Conference Finals. You know how much, much bigger of a star you'd be just off of being in the playoffs, just off of going this far in the playoffs? I just don't think he cares about any of that, though. <laughs> like, I mean, listen, if you tell me you don't care, then I have nothing to say. I don't. It is what it is. You already he, make – He can't, right? Because if he did, this nothing's changed, right? Like, Portland mm-hmm. has been Portland this whole time. I genuinely think he is content. Because, again, he's a guy that went to a small mid-major in college, right? So he mm-hmm. lo- loyalty is like a core aspect of him, drafted by Portland. Uh, again, like I said, has the family raised there. They, he's been there for so long. I genuinely think he doesn't care about all the other aspects of wanting to be in New York or L.A. or Miami. Like, he's cool with being in Portland. And he Amen. would love to – it would be great for him to bring a ring there to, to the city, but I just don't – think it can happen with that roster i respect it man come on come come to la man come to la just just pull up bro just pull up to pull up to the lakers man <laughs> nah but if he, he doesn't care it is what it is i respect him so with the spurs getting the number one overall pick you got me thinking i want i want to get your opinion on this stuff what is like what is like the the line of player that you would stop at as far as like would i rather have Women Yama or this player. Okay. So I'm gonna just I'm gonna just say a few ones. Most of these to start, I probably know your answer already. But you know what I'm saying? I'm just I'm just I'm gonna just start it out. So Carl Anthony Towns. One Ben Yama. Three Taliburton. Wemby. Zion Williamson. Still Wemby. Brandon Ingram. Still Wemby. Jalen Brunson. Still Wemby. <laughs> Anthony Edwards. Still Wemby. Okay, 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 okay. Let's make, let's make it a little bit more difficult. 
De'Aaron Fox? Still Wemby. Okay. John Am I Morant. looking at this like just for the Spurs or just in general? Like any team has a number one pick. Like would you just trade? Any team has a number one pick. Okay. Any team has a number one pick. John Morant. Off course stuff aside, just to play. <laughs> say, say he cleans up his act. Mm-hmm. Say, you know what I'm saying? He, you know, buckles it up. You know, he, he's he's not doing that gun stuff no more. Just as a player, as a talent, John Morant. Oh, that's a tough one. Um Am I wilding if I still say Wemby? For John, nah. nah. I, Honestly. I feel like I don't know. I I, I just <laughs> I gotta take Wemby. I need to see it. That's why I'm so excited for Summer League. Like I need to see how translatable this is about to be to the NBA. What what I would say with this one specifically with John Moran, I'd take Wimby as well. Mm-hmm. I just think that so I think that he's getting all this hype for a reason, obviously. Like I, I think as a talent perspective, I don't see a world where he's a bust as a talent. Like I just think his skill set, mm-hmm. like at worst, he's what, Anthony Davis? Like at worst, I feel like. You know what I mean? Like I feel like this is like he's a can't miss guy. The, the seven biggest. foot five rim protector, like <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like I think that as a talent, he cannot be a bust, in my opinion. Biggest concern is his injuries. Right. I feel like there's also injury concern with John Morant as well. It's like he's a high flying guard. A lot of times you yeah. see they have end up having knee problems or whatever, mm-hmm. and their career doesn't really translate like later into the career. So or their play style doesn't translate. Excuse me. So my opinion, I take Wimby over John Morant. So you're not bugging for that one. Okay. Donovan Mitchell. We were reaching that that tier of player where it's like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm still taking one B. I take one B as well. I love Donovan. That's my guy. I love Donovan Mitchell. All right. Shea Gildress Alexander. Oh my God. <laughs> He's young too. He's young, averaging young to like 30 Ruben. plus points a yeah. game. First team all NBA Shea. Six six guard. I'm trying to put myself in the mindset of a GM. Like I just got the number one pick, and the I get I look at my phone. It's the Thunder. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll give you Shay. Shay with Wimby straight up. Ah man. I still gotta take Wimby. Ah. I still gotta take Wimby. Man. Yo. It just feels wrong. If you're not giving me, like, Giannis, I don't know, <laughs> man. Like, it's tough. With that one, hmm. So, yeah, I agree with you with all these passes. Like, I would have took Wimby over all them guys. With this one, uh, Shay, I think, makes sense. Like, I, it, I, could, I could see myself doing it just because he's still young. Like, he's proven. It's like you don't even really have the question factor of, like, just because you've seen him do it already, right? Mm-hmm. And he's only going to get better. So it's like, that the that's thing. the one where it's like, oh. yeah, I could I could take Shea in that, that situation. I, I Personally, I probably would still keep Wemby, but, like, I wouldn't, wouldn't fault having that trade happen. My thing is, right, I feel like Wimby is still a big man. I know he plays on a perimeter like a guard, but he's still a big man. And most of the time in history, let's even look at the Nuggets, right, with Jokic. Jokic is killing it. Jokic is, like, obviously, he's already an all-time great, it seems like, as far as, like, a talent perspective. Mm -hmm. Even with the best big men, like, ever, the best big men to play in the league, you still need a guard to kind of close out the game for the most part. Like, look at the game. Uh, the Lakers was a game two, the Nuggets game, game two. He always had a great game. But Jamal Murray closed that game. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah. that guard was the guy, Kobe and Shaq. Shaq was so dominant. Fourth quarter time, it was Kobe. It's Giannis Shaq. and Chris Middleton. Giannis, that's what I'm saying. And Shea is like, bro, he's... Oh, that's so tough. Damn, that's so tough. I'm going with me. I, I said all that, but I just... The upside is too, too much. Crazy. I'm sorry. The upside is too crazy, man. I watch uh. his games and my jaw just drops on the floor. This mm. is, it looks like 
2K. It doesn't look real. It looks fake. Bro, you remember them, uh, was it 2K16, like little demigods like, running around <laughs> in the park? That's what he looks like. He looks like one of those. Yo, it does uh, not. I... does not make sense. All right. Damian Lillard. <laughs> if I was a team that had a decent enough cast around it, maybe, realistically, though, I'd still take Wemby. If, if if Dame did not getting Dame did not make him a championship contender, I'm taking one. I'm taking yeah, I'm taking Dame. And it, mind you, this is to be like the best player on your team, basically. Okay. Like so, I'm taking I'm taking um. There's no disrespect to Dame. I'm taking Wimby, but I don't I don't know for sure if Dame could be like a number one on a championship guy. I think you can get far with him, but like a clear cut like number one. Like say you have like Damian Little and like a who's like a good like Jalen Brown. I don't think you win a championship with that. I think you could if you got a good cast. You would have to have like a Boston Celtics great supporting cast around you, I think. Which yeah. is obviously possible, but um, yeah, I think I, I'll take Wimby. Devin Booker. He, you just saw what he did. <laughs> you just saw what Devin Book did in the playoffs. Ah oh, man. But I can't even like if I didn't take Shea, I can't take the book. Facts. <laughs> I was looking at their book right next to each other. <laughs> so just because of like in terms of like how good D book is, how good Shea is, plus they're both younger. Like like D book just now entering his prime. Shea has time before he even gets to that 26, 27 year prime beginning. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, if I didn't take Shea, I gotta take gotta take Wimby here still. Anthony Davis. One B. I think that one was kind of easy. Um, I'm saving this one. <laughs> Just because I feel like it's an interesting one. Kawhi Leonard. Right now, I'm taking one yeah. B. Easily. Kawhi. Yeah. If, if Kawhi could stay healthy, I'd take Kawhi. But he just he can't stay healthy. Oh my God. I just scored up. We got some. All right. Jimmy Butler. <laughs> oh no man that's michael jordan <laughs> yo it's young mj bro you see what he's doing i still gotta take Wemby. just all it's almost just age alone at this point like if you are not sub 26 25 i'm just gonna take one b so with that being said lebron james <laughs> definitely <laughs> Wemby. Wemby gonna yeah. get a shot <laughs> Yeah, I'm dead. <laughs> chill out. Yo, ease out, bro. Chill out, bro. Chill out, chill out, chill out. But now, nah, bro, I've seen, like, um, cause I, obviously, I've seen, like, uh, people do, like, this video like this before, but in the, the conversation with LeBron came up, people act like it was disrespectful to take Wimby over LeBron. LeBron is 38, 38 years old. You're only getting, what, maybe, at best case scenario, two more years of him being, what, the 10th best player in the league right now? Right. What are you talking about, bro? Like, that, that one's yeah. not even hard. Um... Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. <sighs> Luka Doncic. Give me Luka. Oh, the first time, no Wimby. So we're not concerned about Luka defense. We just we taking Luka. That's all I'm. Now listen, I could be agreeing with you. I'm just trying to you know play devil's advocate a little bit. No, it, it's again. It's just like we're at that level of skill and age, like. And then you don't, again, you don't have to worry about the injuries as much. You don't have to worry about how is it going to translate. Like, I know. I know what I'm getting from Luca. I'll take Luca. Jason Tatum. I, wait, I have time on that. Before you answer that, I got to give my answer as well. I would I would also take Luca. I think I'd take Luca. I think yeah. I, you can build a good enough team around him, even though his defense absolutely sucks. You can build enough team, a good enough team around him to – Combat that. So I'll this really should show you how ridiculous of a prospect Wimby is, and we just rattle off this Thanks. many players, and it's like a <laughs> lot of them are like no brainers. Like no, I, I I'll keep my pick. Thank you. <laughs> and bang the line on the GM. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one might hit your heart a little bit. You know what I mean? Jason Tatum. Yeah. <laughs> Twenty four. JT four fan MVP voting. He's 25 years old. Yeah, so I thought he was 19. 
You know, he's, <laughs> he still has, he didn't even hit his prime. He's only 19, bro. Um, He's technically, because of Pete, like the way, like people say, your prime technically starts when you're like 27. That's when people say, like, you're at the peak of your power. So technically, he is not in his prime. He's not. So. It, athletically, I actually learned this from my strength coach in college. Your tendons get the most elastic from like ages like 27 is like peak elasticity. And then like it starts downgrading from there. So what you're saying is I can still make the league? Shit, bro. You got to get in the lab. Say that. Say that. <laughs> oh, <Man. clears throat> dang. Tatum or Wemby? Oh, man. I still almost want to take Wemby. <laughs> Yo. I really do. I, my gut feeling is just like, Wemby feels like, even if you, even if it's wrong, he doesn't hit the crazy expectation. It's like, you got to try. <laughs> you got to see. You got to see if it's not. You got to see. Yeah, I'll I take Wimby. JT is tough. That's tough. That's tough. That's up there with Shea. It's like the hardest, hardest no. So, I think the whole time you were talking, I was trying to think of my answer, and I still don't have my answer. <laughs> I think I low-key might take Tatum, bro. Just like, I, I think like I said, he's still – I know he's been in – it seems like he's been in the league forever just because they've been in the Eastern Conference Finals damn near every year. But it's like he's still only 25. Like, yep. man, I think I might take Tatum. I, I wouldn't fault I, you. I, I think uh, I might take Tatum. <clears throat> it's just the, that upside. I'm literally looking at a picture of him right now. It's like, bro, this dude is 7'5", bro. Listen, I, just, I do not blame you at all, but all right. These are going to get interesting because a lot. there's just a lot of factors with these. Like, mm -hmm. obviously, these we're getting into like the top five players, you know what yeah. I mean? But there's a lot of factors that go into them. So mm -hmm. I'll start out with this one. Joel Embiid. Right now, <laughs> give me Wemby. Wow, the MVP of the league. Only MVP ain't made a conference finals, man. Oh, that's tough. That's tough. You know what's even tougher? I'm agreeing with you. Give me Wimby. <laughs> <laughs> give me Wimby. Yeah. What? It's not like a no-brainer, but, like, give me Wimby, bro. Give me Wimby. Because Embiid right. already got the injury concern. Exactly. See? That's why I said it gets tougher because it's yeah. not just, not just, like, I feel like because we're going to make this a clip. People are going to be on our heads like Joel Embiid just came off of da, 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 especially with these other players. The age is more of is a concern with some of these players mm -hmm. and the injury concern. It's like if we're already having injury concerns with who do we talk about? Uh, Like with like a John Morant. It's like then give me the guy that has best like best player ever upside. You know what I mean? So it's like yeah. we're already going to have injury concerns. We might as well go for the craziest upside possible. Right. Now, this one is interesting. Kevin Durant. One B, he's too old. Okay, I agree. I agree. But oh my god, they're gonna be on our heads for that one. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna I'm gonna just be. like, come on, <laughs> you if you are a GM, you have the opportunity to draft a what is he, 18 year old, 19 year old, 19, seven mm -hmm. foot five my player to your team, or get a 34 year old Kevin Durant who just had Achilles tear, just spent what I was it two months out of this season with a knee sprain boy slipped on a banana pill rolled his ankle we don't do calf raises like <laughs> <laughs> just but like just like jokes aside like realistically it's like <laughs> you're getting a couple years at the back half of the best of KD versus the start to a career of someone that is literally probably the third or fourth biggest prospect the NBA has ever seen realistically behind like LeBron Kareem like he's in rare air in terms of how coveted of a prospect he is mm -hmm. like just the opportunity of that you have to take the chance on 
Yeah. I agree. I uh, agree. But you know, this it, I'm they're gonna be on our heads. That's all I'm gonna say. Yeah. They're gonna be on our heads. And I'm for it. I don't care. Yeah. It is what it is. But <clears throat> all right. Steph Curry. Wemby. It's just age. It's just age. This one is tough because I think you could be I could be completely wrong. Steph Curry just seems like one of those not humans. You know what I mean? Like yeah. <laughs> he's 35 and he plays like he's like 28. Like he doesn't seem like he just had even. probably his best year ever. I said like he don't even seem like but it's like you just said it, he's 35. He's gonna see him be playing like this at 38. Even if he plays like this to bro, 40, that's five years. In five years, Wimbenyama is gonna be 24. You got another decade after that. And he still might be in his prime, you know? Like, that's 15, 15 years versus five. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Man. Oh, my God. This is hard, bro. Because, like, like I said, he just – Steph has some injury concerns, I guess. You could say that. Like, he, earlier in his career, he was had, like, the ankle problems. Even this year, he got hurt. Didn't he have, like, a shoulder thing he got hurt? Mm-hmm. Like, he hurt his shoulder or something? Yeah. I'll take Wimby, man. God. Like, like, bro, like this is, like, it's Steph Curry. It's like, well, this is the greatest shooter ever, a top 10 player ever. What's that we're going to take Wimby Yama over him just off of the sheer fact that, like, this dude potentially could be, like, one he of the greatest players unlike ever. Unlike something we've ever seen. I know it's for real when you're literally at, like you have NBA reporters that's been covering the league for four plus decades. Like, can you give me a comp? And they're like, no, I don't know what to tell you. He plays like I've never seen something like it before in my 40 plus years of watching the sport at the professional level for my job. I cannot tell you that he like I can't even give you someone in that realm, we've never seen anything like it. All right. Giannis Antetokounmpo. So now we've reached there. I'm assuming the only people left is him and Jokic, right? Yeah. <laughs> I will take Giannis. I will take Jokic because in my head, I always have the thought process of it's always worth it to get the championship people want clown the lakers because they were good they got the ring and then whatever the team was bad for the next couple years Mm -hmm. as a cowboys fan bro i don't care if we was the worst nfl team for the next 40 years (laughs) if we got one super bowl (laughs) just one it feel worth it to me Giannis and Jokic are guys who right now in this second for the next feels like this season, the next foreseeable two to three years minimally. They're on your team. You are a contender if you put a mildly competent roster around them. Like outside of what happened with Giannis this year, and obviously he got injured, but Mm -hmm. seeing what Jokic is doing right now, putting up one of the most ridiculous postseason runs we've ever seen. We know that Giannis is already an NBA champion. And he had a ridiculous postseason run. Put up 50 to close out the Suns in game six of that, that finals. To me, you get either one of those guys. It's like you're doing the same type of thing where you're like trading away your assets to go all in. And that feels like a super safe bet to do it for a guy like Jokic or Giannis. So those two and Luka, I guess, are the only three players that I would maybe trade the number one overall pick for. Okay. That's, so, isn't, that, that was the thing that was making it tough with Steph, because I feel like Steph is also in that conversation of, like, you put him on your team, you're a championship contender, but he's 35. These guys are both right. 28. Like, yeah. That's a that is big difference. That's a huge difference. So, so, so far, you said, so the only players in the league that you will not trade for Wimbenyama is Jokic, Giannis and Luca. Yeah. Right. You said you said you were trading for Tatum, right? No, I took one B. Okay. I think I said all of the same, but I think I still I said all of the same except I would keep Tatum. Just because of the fact that he's 25. Like he's still very, very young. Like yeah. 
So, <clears throat> wow, that was that's interesting. Wow, this kid is this is crazy, bro. This wow. is absolutely crazy. Like, this is much how it felt when uh for the people that saw like LeBron, all the LeBron hype back in the day. Like, this must be how it felt. It's crazy to look back and watch the coverage because they are they are sending ESPN to his high school games as a junior. Bro got right. a whole nother season to play after this one. And he's already being covered as a number one draft pick. Bob Costas is asking him in an interview. So he's 17 or 18 years old. He said, how does it feel that if you're not going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer, you're going to be viewed as a bust? That's crazy. That's a, a lot teenager. of pressure. teenager. That's a lot of pressure, bro. Like, and to not fold under all of that pressure and actually become arguably the greatest player ever at worst, second greatest, is even crazier. Yeah. Like, the fact that, like, even with all of those expectations, he exceeded them. Like, nobody was said, like, they, they said, he said first battle Hall of Famer. He right. didn't say become the league's all-time scoring leader. Like, no one right. said all that. And That's his crazy. place is safe on NBA Mount Rushmore, according to Stephen A. Smith, because he beat <laughs> Steph. So, we're good there. Right. <laughs> um, but, yeah, like, in, you even see Chris, Chris Broussard said if he – if he has a career, Wimbenyama has a career like AD or Hakeem or Kevin Garnett, it's a like he's a bust. It's a failure. That's not fair. Like it, it's wrong when they did to LeBron to say if you don't make the Hall of Fame, you're a bust. Right. It, it should be wrong then. It should be wrong now, bro. What are we talking about? If you're right. KG, if you're Hakeem, that's a failure. If you're a top 10 player of all time, that's a failure. You have to be a top five or better. Like, that's not a fair – like like you said, it, like, because they always say, like, oh, we said that about LeBron. Yeah, it was wrong back then, too. Like, that's not right. – that was not fair to LeBron to say. It was not fair to Magic when he was coming out. It was not fair to any of these players when they were coming out to say, like, if you're not the top five player ever, you're a bust. Like, that's not fair, bro. Right. Like, it's not fair at all. So, it's like – Bus gets used way too much in covering NBA players. Like – Mm-hmm. At, as, as high as the expectations can be, like, it, bro, he legitimately only would be a bust, in my opinion, is if he stayed healthy and was shooting, like, 25% from the field, could not block anything on the other side of the court. He couldn't, mm-hmm. like, none of the dribbling, none of the shot creation translated. Like, everything that we expected of him would have to fail while he's healthy. Right. I don't even like viewing guys like Greg Oden as a bust. Like that's not a. I mean, out like, of his injuries, control. you cannot control injuries. Like it's, it's tough, bro. Like when someone gets injured, you cannot say like, oh yeah, he was just like one of the biggest bust in NBA history. It's like, bro, he didn't even have a fair shake at playing. Right. Like, that's not fair to him to say that he was the biggest bust in NBA history. So right, guys like Adam Morrison, more comfortable at least because it's like it, it, there was nothing about. You know, it's not injury related. It just mm-hmm. you didn't pan out to be what you expected. Darko Milicic, you didn't pan out to be what you were expected to be. Like right. far off of those projections and expectations. It wasn't injury related. The game just didn't translate from what we had seen previously. Mm-hmm. Would you say Andrew Wiggins is a bust? No, I don't think he's a bust. He's made it. He's literally. A- he was a second a- option on a championship team. Exactly. That's not a bust, bro. That's, that's not a bust. He was an all-star starter that year. Right. He's, he was an all-star. Like you said, second best player on the championship level team. Made viable contributions to that team, even the, like even this year. It's like, yep. he's not, that's not a bust, bro. Right. It's not a bust. So. People think if they don't check every single box and prediction that they made for them, it's like, oh, this guy stinks. But it's like Marcus Russell is a bust. That's that we're talking about bust. <laughs> That's a bust, bro. Like, <laughs> like that should be like the, the poster child for being yeah. a bust. So not these injury guys. Yeah, definitely not. That the word just gets overutilized way too much, bro. Like you we've got to be realistic here. It's only space at the top for so many players. You're gonna sit up here and tell me if this dude is not because Hakeem is what top. Five, four, center all time. You can't be much lower than that. I'm just trying to go top of my head, right? Like you got like Shaq, Kareem, he's three. Shaq, he's Kareem, three. Will, guys mm-hmm. like that, right? So you tell me this dude is a top five player at his position ever in the history of basketball. 
It's not good enough. That's what you just said. How, you know how like how wild does that sound? That's ridiculous, bro. Like, yeah. that's just an unfair expectation to put on a 19 year old kid. Exactly. Like, he hasn't even played in the NBA yet, and you're saying like if you're not a Hall of Fame, if you're not, he ain't even top- came to America yet. To, 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 like, bro. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not. Michael Jordan or LeBron James or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you're a bust. Like, come on, bro. What are we talking about here? All right. Yeah. That's way, crazy. way too much of a – you can have crazy expectations and keep it limited to how crazy of a player he can be on the court. Mm-hmm. Everything is so quick to so quick to compare, like, not even from, like, a, a player comp perspective, but, like, you have to be on par with this person's career, this person's legacy. Like, why do we – not we, but talking about sports media as a whole, like why mm-hmm. do we do this? It's not worth it. And it just it really just fills airtime and creates talking points that we're That's making out of thin air. That's really all it is. It just they just bored. They just want something to talk about. Yeah. I better hope the Lakers pull it out because we they say I know they're gonna find a way. If the Lakers lose the series, they're gonna be finding a way to post LeBron. Post the Lakers during bro. the NBA Finals, bro. Remember in 2019 when we missed the playoffs, and I'm seeing segments about LeBron and the Lakers. I'm like, leave us alone. Why are you even talking about us right now? Yep. Like, bro, it is crazy. Like when last year, even this year, we were trash. Well, us, we're getting talked about the most in the league. I'm like, bro, leave us alone. Like, I like, I don't think people think that. Like, people who are not Lakers fans also think that. Like. Like where to blame for that? Or like we like getting talked about. Me, I can't speak for no one else. I can only speak for myself. I don't like getting talked about this much. Yeah. I'd rather be the team that's under the radar that no one knows about. I'd rather be the Nuggets that yeah. <laughs> no one that's disrespected because now it adds a little fuel to the fire too. Right, you get these expectations. You see, like Austin Reeves, people think Austin Reeves is the goat now, which I love Austin Reeves, but like he gets a little bit too much, a little bit too much media hype now. One hundred percent. Bro, I, I don't I don't really like it to be honest. I'd rather be that team that nobody talks about. Last thing before we wrap it up, I'm looking at the prize picks lines for tonight. Just gonna go through some of the point totals. LeBron James over under 25 and a half points must win game three at home. I don't like it just because I feel like he can have an in a very impactful game scoring like 22 points. Like, I don't I don't feel like we need him to score 30 for us to win. I think yeah. it's a big AD game, though. I think AD bounces back. Okay, they got AD's his PRA, points, mm-hmm. rebounds, and assists, set at 40 and a half. Well, he's locked in for a double-double, that's for sure. So he's okay. definitely going to give you – I don't know about assists. I don't know AD's assist numbers. I don't think he averages a lot of assists, to be honest. But even if he got a 20-20 game, I need one assist if you, if you put that bet. 30 20 game would do it. 25 and 15 game just about do it. If I'm being honest, I I think I'd rather bet on the LeBron one than the AD one. Because I listen, betting on AD is a this gambling in general. That is a legit gamble, bro. <laughs> AD is the worst person to gamble on, bro. If I'm being honest, you don't so know if, which version you get in that night. Exactly. If it was between them two, then I then I'd rather do the LeBron plus 25. Okay. Jokic is PRA. His his lines oh are crazy. 52 and a half. Yep, he's you penciling him in for 25, 15 dimes. That 40, 10. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even bro, you know what his fantasy point over under is? That's just probably crazy. 63 and a half. And the craziest part is he's cleared the line in the last five games. He's averaging seventy one fantasy points over the last five. I heard so I don't I don't do basketball fantasy, but I heard that like Jokic is like the that's like the Cooper Cup of like the NBA fantasy. Like Cooper Cup, Christian McCaffrey, like yeah, because he does gives you he fills the stat sheet in every way. Right, he had eighty one point two fantasy points in um in game one of the the Lakers series. You get like it's a point. For, you get one fancy point per point, 1.2 for every rebound, one and a half points for every assist, and then it's three points for a block or a steal, and you lose a point on a turnover. Just like people that play both sides of the ball are like the cheat codes in fantasy because like you get two mm-hmm. blocks and two steals, that's what, 12 points. 
off the right. rip, minus any of the rest of the stats that you have. But he just be filling it up on points, rebounds, and assists, man. Last one, I'm going to go back to just overall points. Almost had this amount in the fourth quarter of game two. Jamal Murray set at 24 and a half. Um, so over, under, what's your thoughts on that for, for game three tonight? I like that because I think this game, I don't see the world, the role players of the Nuggets having a huge game. You know, role players play better at home. Mm-hmm. They've been playing a little bit like over their head, just a, just a little bit. Like They've been playing well, but I think that the role players for the Nuggets don't play as well. So that means, you know, Jamal Murray, Nicole Yoke is going to have to step up scoring-wise. So I like that line. Jeff Green over under four and a half points. Under. <laughs> <laughs> under. Uh, it's what, funny yo, that... Why why are they sagging off of Jeff Green now? What couldn't he can't Jeff Green shoot? Am I missing something? No, he definitely can. Definitely can. So why are we treating him like Vando? Like they're like, oh yeah, when Jeff Green's in hand, we're gonna leave him open to sag off like Aaron Gordon. I'm like, Jeff Green can shoot last time I checked. What are we what are we talking about? I don't know what his percentages have been this playoffs, but it's like historically he's not a bad shooter, right? Exactly, bro. He hit. I my I because I remember Jeff Green hitting. What was it? Was it six or seven? It wasn't seven three. It had to be like six threes when he was on the Nets. That game that KD had a forty nine point triple double. Jeff Green hit like five threes at least. He's having a down shooting year based on his career averages. He's a career like thirty four percent three point shooter. This season he was 29. This postseason he's shooting 25. percent So, mm. you know, they got the scouting report. Uh, yeah, ain't no more than me, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's going to do it for another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Um, as always, please be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Like I said earlier, if you're listening on Apple and Spotify and you listen to the whole episode, you're a real one. First of all, and two, go ahead, pause the episode now. Drop a five star on the on the podcast. Leave a, leave mm-hmm. a review. It helps the pod out a ton. Um, but yeah, I'm Billy. That's Dame, and we out. Peace. Yes, sir.